Well, I'd also like to thank you all for coming today and in particular for staying to the last talk where today I'll be speaking about these targeted treatments where we can directly target diseases of the bone. As a clinical endocrinologist where I treat patients every day, one of the most exciting parts of my job is how we can take all this innovative, cutting-edge research, apply that in the clinic room today so that we can help you, your family and friends to treat your bone disease. So you can now all t talk about this in your sleep, um, but just to, just to orientate you to my version of the slide because I'll keep referring back to this picture. Essentially bone remodelling is a coupled process. We have the osteocytes that live in the cells, in the bone, the osteoblasts that build bone by secreting factors that stimulate the osteoclast precursors into activated osteoclasts which resorb bone. And overall, this process is coupled between the osteoblast and osteoclast, so that as you have increase in the osteoblast formation, you also get increase in osteoclast resorption. So the first group of medications are the bisphosphonates, and these work by targeting the osteoclast, shutting them down so they can't do their function anymore. So you have a decrease in bone resorption and ultimately uh, less bone loss. Here you can see that in a bone biopsy of a patient treated with bisphosphonates, um, there's preservation of bone mass and bone structure compared to with no treatment. Currently in Australia, we have three main agents that are used. The tablets Alendronate or Fosamax, Resedronate or Actinil, and an intravenous or injection into the vein, Zeledronate, which is marketed as A-Cluster or Zometa. And in one of the very first trials published in 1996, we found that Alendronate reduces fractures in osteoporosis. So whether you want to be a lumper or a splitter for fracture types, you can see that all fractures were reduced and overall by 30 to 50 percent. And since then, over the last 20 years, we've had ongoing studies to show that this, is, uh, this occurs in all the types of bisphosphonates and in a different group of um, patients. So in osteoporosis, bisphosphonates are approved for use because it improves bone density, reduces fractures, and importantly, improves your survival. So above and beyond the reduction in fracture, bisphosphonates actually improve your overall survival. So what about in cancer? Well, we know that we've already seen from Peter that myeloma is a devastating disease affecting the bones. And again, the bisphosphonates, particularly the intravenous form, zeledronate, has been shown to improve density and reduce fractures. In breast and prostate cancer, which is spread to the bone, bisphosphonates have also been useful. Um, and in particular, also in reducing some of the complications that can occur when you have um, cancer that have spread to the bone, including need for surgery and radiotherapy. But just again, just to highlight that not only are bone-related outcomes affected by these medications, but actually survival has also been shown to improve with treatment with, os with bisphosphonate. So that is, above and beyond chemotherapy and cancer-specific treatments, bisphosphonates can improve survival. Overall, these medications are very well tolerated. We've had a lot of experience with them, and we know that some of the very rare side effects that can occur may be due to long-term use. The next medication is denosumab, and this works by blocking osteoclast activation. So normally the osteoblast secretes factors, rank ligand, to stimulate the osteoclast precursors into their activated form, and denosumab works by blocking that signal from attaching to its receptor so that the osteoclast can't be activated. This is marketed as prolia in osteoporosis or exchiever in cancer. And again, in 2009, this was published showing that if you were treated with denosumab here in the dark blue bars, compared to if you weren't on any medication here in the light blue, you can see that there was an overall reduction in vertebral fractures by 68% if you had osteoporosis. And then in early breast cancer, a study was published in 2015 showing that here again, if you were treated with, with denosumab in red compared to no treatment in blue, you had an overall reduction of any fracture by 50%. So very high and very successful reduction in fractures. So now in Australia, prolia is used um, in osteoporosis because it improves bone density and fractures. We don't yet have data on survival. And again, in the cancer field with both myeloma and breast and prostate cancer spread to the bone, there's improvement in bone density fractures and fractures. There's emerging evidence, in particular in early breast cancer, that there might be again a survival benefit above and beyond that of cancer-related and chemotherapy treatments. 
And importantly, denosumab has been shown to be even better than zoledronic acid um, or bisphosphonate at reducing some of the cancer-related bone effects in, in breast cancer. Again, overall, denosumab is well tolerated and particularly in contrast to the bisphosphonates can be used in some of these patients who have impairment of their kidney function, but there are some risks when you stop the treatment. The next group of medications are the hormone-based therapies, and these work by blocking osteoclast activation and really are there just to undo the effects that ha happen after menopause. And this can be done either through conventional menopausal hormone therapy with estrogen and progesterone, or estrogen-like compounds such as livial or tibolone or raloxifene or avista. For a long time now, we've known that hormone therapy improves bone density and reduces fractures. But one of the big headlines in the early 2000s were some of the concerns associated with risks from menopausal hormone therapy, which led to a, decrease, a significant decrease in the use of um, menopausal hormone therapy. Um, which is a bit of a shame because there are many other potentials of hormone therapy, and particularly in younger women close to the menopause, it can be very safe. But there are some risks that do need to be considered. So, so far I've talked about all the anti-resorptive medications, those which switch off the osteoclast-driven bone resorption. But we also have teriparatide, which actually works by directly stimulating the osteoblast to increase bone formation. So now we're actually building up bone. But due to the coupling effect between osteoblast and osteoclast, you get overall a significant increase in osteoblast function, but you also do get a slight increase in resorption as well. And this is marketed as Forteo and is the only available bone building agent in Australia currently. But a abalaparatide, which is a similar agent, has just been approved for use overseas. And again, you can see here in a bone biopsy, again of a human patient, that um, teriparatide increases bone density. Again, reduces vertebral and non-hip fractures here compared to no treatment. But one of the limitations is that overall uh, uh, lifetime use is limited to 18 months in, uh, in Australia um, due to some, a very rare concern of increased risk of bone cancer seen only in animals that has not been seen in, in humans. The other issue is that it's currently very expensive to, be, to, to use um, and so there are strict criteria for PBS reimbursement. So, so far we've talked about agents that decrease bone resorption. I've shown you teriparatide, which increases bone formation, but has some limitations, including a slight increase in bone resorption. And so the holy grail is really, can we uncouple the osteoblast and osteoclast? Can we do, do we have a medication that can simultaneously increase bone formation and decrease resorption. And the exciting thing is that we do have something, and I want to show you how this came about in a very beautiful way. So this is a picture of a woman who has a very rare condition called Van Buchen's disease. And as you can see, she's got a very large, enlarged jaw, and her, her bones are much heavier compared to those who do not have this disease. It's a very rare condition, and it took some time, but eventually scientists worked out that this was due to a mutation in a gene called SOST. And so they worked out that, well, clearly SOS, the SOS gene must be very important in regulating bone formation. And what they found was that it was important in coding a protein called sclerostin. Now, sclerostin is secreted by the osteocytes and under normal conditions binds to its receptor on the osteoblast and actually works as a negative regulator. That is, tells the osteoblast to stop increasing bone formation. So you can see in conditions where this is going wrong, such as Van Buchen's disease, you get unre unregulated proliferation of bone, which in that case is bad. So then very clever scientists thought, well, how can we harness this? How can we use this to our benefit? And they developed um, an antibody, a protein again, called romosozumab, which works by blocking the effects of sclerostin. So that now instead of letting sclerostin bind to its receptor, um, the osteoblasts are free and they can increase in their stimulation of bone formation. But also, and very excitingly, at the same time, it also worked at directly inhibiting the osteoclast activation as well. So now we do have uncoupling of the osteoblast and osteoclast, so we have simultaneous increase in bone formation and a decrease in bone resorption. And you can see here in an animal study that romosozumab treatment increased bone density. When compared to placebo in humans, there was a reduction in vertebral fractures by a whopping 75%, which in, it, in and of itself is already impressive. But even more excitingly, for the first time we had a head-to-head -head trial looking at romosozumab compared an active agent 
alendronate, our first bisphosphonate. And you could see that with treatment with romosozumab, there was an increase in bone density and a decrease in vertebral fractures even, be, even above beyond alendronate. So is romosozumab what we've been waiting for? Well, as you can imagine, there's been a flurry of studies that have come out um, in the last few years. And the exciting thing is that investigators are confirming safety within use for patients now. And ideally, this could be the holy grail that could help us for osteoporosis and ideally also in cancer-related bone disease. So today I've shown you that there are many effective and safe treatments that we've been able to develop through our understanding of the bone remodeling cycle. There are the anti-resorptive agents, bisphosphonates, donosumab, and estrogen therapy. Teriparatide is our bone building agent, which increases bone formation. And romosozumab is the exciting new agent that might be something that we can use very soon in our lifetime. And I just want to finish off by saying, well, we've got all these exciting treatments. How do we know which one is the best one to use? Well, it's certainly not a one-size-fits-all approach. And so I'd encourage you to speak to your doctor and to see what treatments would be best for you and your bone health. Thank you for listening. Thank you.